happy that Dr. Steve Peters is here with us again. He is uh, Director of Psychology at Cherry Hospital. We want to give everybody a chance to uh, learn a little bit more about mental health on campus, uh, some of the identifiers and some of the stats related to that. So we're here for session two today. Nicole was going to pass around two sign-in sheets to a sign-in for us. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody coming today. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Dan. Since they're recording this, they've asked me to use this microphone, which is another piece of gadgetry that I probably otherwise wouldn't be using. But I like to just come down and talk, and instead of being so formal up on the stage, so this kind of works. And let's just sort of, by juggling this gadgetry, if you bear with me on that. But uh, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate these opportunities to come out and talk to people about a really a, a critical, important topic, which is suicide and suicide awareness. It's not a funny topic. There's no real joke I can start with. Uh, just there's no way to do that. Uh, did you hear about the guy? The two guys going to the bar. There's no joke about it. Anymore. There's a couple of things I'm going to cover today, and I'm going to keep repeating it. I want you to understand what a large, serious issue this is. That it's real, it's big, it's increasing, and it's something that you probably, if you haven't dealt with it, you're going to be some time. You're going to be faced with. Uh, either in the community or here at the, at the university. So it's a topic that you sort of need to know. We also know that the more you know about it, just having good information, the more you're, the better you're going to handle it when that opportunity does present itself. Uh, in primary prevention, or just in prevention, we talk about primary prevention. How do you keep something from happening in the first place? Well, it's by being informed and kind of trying to address and put services in place. Secondary prevention is sort of when we try to mitigate an uh, event after it's occurred, and then you know the tertiary part is how we deal with the aftermath. So we're going to talk about really all three parts of that. Uh, there's a little bit of a caution because it's a, it's a difficult, uh, emotionally loaded conversation to have. Uh, so I kind of put a little, uh, I guess I said PG. I took out the really bad slides. So it's nothing more than PG, and so, uh, but we have to talk about some serious issues, and some people do that. Let me tell you, I do have two speeds. I have fast, uh, because I have a lot to talk about, and a really small opportunity window, and I didn't have, st I have stopped. Uh, so I have the gas pedal, you have the brake. So it, I would encourage you to stop me, ask a question, offer a comment, the more active we make this, obviously the better you learn, the more engaged you are. I can sit up here and ramble on a long time, just like all the guys you do, that's what we do for a living, you talk a long time, and I do that too. Um, but we know if you have more conversations about it, it makes more sense. Um, I also tell you that, um, tell you a little bit about me, because uh, I tend to rush right through this. Uh, Carson Newman College, very much like uh, Mount Olive, uh, Carson Newman went university status a couple few years back. And so I think uh, Mount Olive is very much like Carson Newman over in East uh, Tennessee. From there, I uh, picked up a bachelor's in undergrad, or uh, a bachelor's in psychology, a master's at Middle Tennessee State. And from there, I moved to Chicago for my doctorate in, in uh, psychology and practiced in Chicago for 25 years before moving down to Goldsboro and Cherry Hospital uh, just about 12 years ago now. So I'm Director of Psychology and Forensic Services at Cherry, which means I supervise a whole big you know, herd of psychologists and do a lot of other things for our Forensic Services team. And so I certainly enjoy this opportunity to get out and just talk to people a while. Uh, here's what we're going to cover today. Juggle all of this. Again, just sort of a lot of facts about suicide. And I'm going to try to get through those a little more quickly today, uh, just so you have an appreciation for the scope and the intensity of this issue, kind of what to watch for, because there's a lot of information about people who, who, who sort of give us the sign. If they're not saying, hey, look at me, I'm suicidal today, there are other things that you could be savvy to, be attentive to, that should be on their radar screen. So how to talk to somebody, we'll cover a little bit about that, and then of course just how to face or how to, how to do it. If in the event somebody does kill themselves, how are you gonna process that, how are you gonna take that in, what, uh, what are you gonna make of that? Again, make, you get some training before you go up. It makes a world of sense. This got the pleasant time I can talk and put this slide in is going to be in there. I just think it's a good slide. 
right? So you're going to see it. Uh, you know, one of these tables is the ejection seat, the other is a landing gear. Where, where did that demand go? When you're faced with a crisis, you know, psychiatric mental health issue, you, can, you can't get online, look up on the internet, like, where's that student manual? That's not the time for that. Uh, you have to be talking to someone, you have to know what you're doing already. So, talking about it today, big, big prep, right? You're kind of getting the, what the campus policy and protocol is, so we're kind of getting this big picture and dialing this in a little bit so it makes some sense. So it's a big problem. A lot of people are killing themselves, a couple thousand um, a day, jumping off the planet, I uh, said. One out of 12 and a half, half seconds or thereabout for adults is the 10th leading cause of death. If you take men out of that, take women out of that equation, you look at men, it's the eighth leading cause of death for men. You look at the young people that we're really concerned about, the college age kids, it's the third leading cause of death. Motor vehicle accidents, death by car, motor vehicle, they don't drive so well, and they're a little bit overconfident, so they uh, have a lot of deaths by car. Second of all, homicide is, is sort of next on the list, but suicide is a, a quick, uh, just barely behind homicide for them. Uh, nationally, this is what I kind of want to point out to you. The United States right now as of 2014, 2015, data is still being compiled by the encounter and whoever does that, 13.4, 13.4, sort of what we use as a baseline. And that's what the rest of the country has. So if they have a population of 100,000 people, I think that's about Wayne County, I think. Paul Park is 100,000 people. Um, you have about 13 and a half uh, a year of suicides. I think that's lifetime pre prevalence in versus annual. It's annual in a lot of people. For college students, a lot of folks have thought about it. Here's what I'm saying. It, if you just ask, have you ever thought about ending suicide, ending your life with everything? Research says about 80% of people will tell you, I, I actually thought about that. I wondered just what that would happen. You know, um, that doesn't mean that I've contemplated seriously ending my, my life. Uh, but if you ask college students, about 20% of them, they, they've really struggled with that, that thought. Uh, a lot of folks uh, have made an attempt in the last 12 months, 10%. Um, one or three percent of those, of, of that crowd, will actually require medical attention for whatever attempt that might have been. Good place to say that we're going to break this down into attempters and completers. And that sounds a little clinical and a little bit coarse to call them that, but that's just how we, we have to sort of think about this. Making suicide attempts is, is sort of one field of study, and then what we learn from fatalities is different. I've always tended to focus on the fatalities. They're kind of speaking to us probably a little bit louder to me um, than what attempters do. And it's a little bit different process in how we deal with attempters. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's just what I said. Uh, it's also interesting to think about where, unfortunately, we don't live in Las Vegas, but that's the highest rate in the country right now, at about 34.5. What was the base? Um, it's about a third of that, right? So uh, Las Vegas, I mean, most of the economic pressures is kind of what we think about, so kind of why that's so high. Um, attempts, data on attempts is pretty soft. Why? Because if you go home and take an overdose that you think will kill you, and you just wake up in the middle of the night and throw it up a few times and get up tomorrow and go to work. No one knows if you try to kill yourself. You just know what you're doing. Um, there are a lot of attempts that no one knows about. They're not attended to. Uh, no medical care is offered or needed. Uh, would have been useful, but no one sought out care. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make a, a gaming. We don't count that. So we really don't know how many attempts are really made that were just, oh well, I lived through it, I guess, I guess I'm supposed to be here. And so people shake it off and keep going. Um, this graph looks a little bit dated, 
is an important sort of picture. And here's what I want to point out. Look at the slope of this graph in terms of the rate of uh, suicides in young people. It levels off for most people, and then it starts climbing up again as we get older. And the, the perspective is there's a lot of adjustment, there's a lot of change going on in those ages, and, and also in these ages, not even a lot of change, there's a lot of isolation. So isolation and disconnect, from what I think about young folks, when the kids are disconnected, and unplugged, and you know, alone, that's when sort of negative <coughs> suicidal thoughts can kind of develop. Um, so like I said, it's sort of the cause of death. A lot of folks are thinking about it. Uh, in, obviously, in North Carolina, this whole part of the country, we're taking care of folks in, in a fairly rural environment. And as much as we would want to think that in an urban setting, whatever pressures come from living in that kind of stressful urban environment, it's actually kids who live in, urban, in rural areas are far more at risk than because why? Because there's the lack of resources. They're disconnected, they're isolated, there's one of opportunity that you don't see in cities. Uh, in some cities, there, there are resources, anywhere you point to, there's a lot of resources to turn to. There's a lot of ways to be engaged and involved. And so for a kid to kind of drift off the screen and be adrift and unplug, that's really easy in a rural uh, setting. Ultimately, it's the medical examiner's office who's going to decide whether somebody killed themselves. A lot of times we don't really know. And obviously, they're very conservative about that. There's a lot of implications when we say that somebody's death was indeed a suicide. Uh, a lot of misconceptions come up about uh, how we decide that, how, how someone would work through that. Rarely is there a suicide note. You sometimes can tell by the method or the approach, things, some things like that. There are a lot of deaths that are suicides that we just can't tell. And so we tend to either discuss that or write that down as um, accidents. And of course, we absolutely know to rule it in as a suicide, it's a little more hard to do. So the state average right now, state rate is about 13.6. North Carolina used to be um, a little bit high compared to the rest of the country. Uh, we were, forever, we were about, um, 17th in the country, a pretty high suicide rate. And now, we're, we're, I don't know what we said, it's uh, pretty, uh, I think we're like 32 now, so we're pretty, pretty far down. And what's happened is the rest of the country's got far more suicide. We haven't got any better. Suicide rates in North Carolina are still high, but the rest of the country now is even higher, or is high. So we're off just a little bit from the rest of the country, uh, so we don't look so bad. But it's not a good, uh, that's not a good way of looking to do it. everybody look bad. Um, here's what we know about people who kill themselves when they make a fatality. Um, 50 to 60 percent, more than half of them have no prior attempts. The first time they try it is the last time they try it. So there is no second opportunity. Um, well, what are we going to do next time? How are we going to handle this? It was that one opportunity all they had. 60% of those people had no prior mental health treatment. Uh, although the majority of people have mental health uh, psychiatric issues, but they're not getting treatment. They're disconnected. A lot of people have, have seen a physician just prior to it. You look at uh, six months, that's 80%. You know, even that last month before they killed themselves, 50% of them saw a physician. Now the problem is, they didn't go to their doctor to say, listen, I didn't talk to you, I'm thinking I might just end this. I can't live anymore, I'm kill myself. They're going for other problems, other physical complaints, other issues going on in their life. They're finding physicians. A lot of the issues now are when we talk to physicians, but how can we get those guys to ask the right question? Are you talking to people about suicidal problems? How they do it is by guns. Now, in Eastern North Carolina, it's probably not a good idea to talk to people about guns. But when you're having somebody who's suicidal, the first thing you have to do is get the guns out of the house. It doesn't mean the federal government's going to come and take everybody's guns, but it needs to go to Uncle Charlie or Aunt Sarah's. Somebody needs to come and get these guns out of the house because it's guns is probably how 
those people kill themselves. Uh, kind of goes from there. Um, so it's pretty much any way you can, can manage to end your life is what people come up with. Uh, but uh, men tend to be more dressing, like with guns or hanging. Women, they're, they are the more kinder, gentler, neater, cleaner part of this species. And so they tend to do the kind of gentler, like overdoses and things. They're, they're a little more tidy about how they choose to do this. Um, so that's it. So, and again, got guns in the house, I like shooting, that's no problem, right? Of all the people who get killed or die because of guns, 47% of them are suicides. Only 30% are homicides. How many times have we talked to active shooters and uh, you know being prepared for that? And it's, it's tragic that we have issues with people getting shot. And that's an issue. It's a concern. Suicide is much bigger than that. Are we talking about that? Well, we are right now. I'm just saying it's a big issue. Uh, it's hard to me that these stats don't add up. I don't know what happens to the other three percent. I guess they just explode sometimes. I, I think that would be an accident. But I don't know what else it would be. Uh, so anyway. I don't know. I think that's measurement error, it's what we would call it psychology. Uh, it's measurement error all the time. So, here we go talking about how we're going to, what are we looking for, who should be on your radar screen. The way I go through this, when I'm talking to somebody, you've been asked to talk to somebody who's at, potentially at risk for suicide, I'm, I'm kind of counting points in my head based on to what degree, how often does this individual meet those, these demographics. Is there a fit? Um, they're male. Men complete suicide more than women. Women attempted, 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 but men try it one time when they're done. Because why? Because they often use a 12 gauge and not, um, you know, a few packs of nidol. That's different. Um, Caucasian. 73 percent of people kill themselves are by Caucasian. Elderly folks or anything else that kind of puts people up into isolation. They're disconnected, they're, they're not involved in the community, not involved in church, not involved in work anymore, they're tired, uh, or they're just not in school, not in work. They have no way to connect with people. All of those things that allow us to be connected to people. Or they're coming to school, they're coming to class, but they're pretty disconnected. What is he doing after school? What is he doing after class? Well, we don't know. Is he even got friends with anybody? Yeah, we, we don't know, actually. Um, alcohol and substance abuse, about 60% of the time. How much does somebody use that? Certainly on a college campus. Um, kids are sometimes experimenting with that, more than so. And what happens is that tends to loosen people up with a sort of disinhibiting effect. Uh, so somebody who otherwise may not act on these thoughts or impulses, uh, lubricate them up a little bit and they're a little more inclined to. A medical diagnosis, any kind of what I call a tragic, catastrophic medical diagnosis. You go to the doctor, you kind of get the story, listen sir, we've got, we've got some bad news, you've got a brain tumor up there that I just cannot get to it, and it looks like you've got a few months maybe to live. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but it's only it's what's happening. I suggest you, you make the best of it, etc., etc., etc. And somebody goes home and says, I'm not doing that. And just thinks it. So that immediately after a catastrophic, really it's not even a medical diagnosis, but after a catastrophic life event, can somebody navigate or mitigate through that? It's kind of an issue. A family history of complete mom, dad, brother, sister, somebody in that immediate family, and maybe it was years ago, who actually completed suicide put somebody real high up, big points, uh, if that's a fact. Um, de depression or mental illness, 90% of the time. Uh, so what, what's our track record in terms of, you know, what, well, right now, what is somebody dealing with? And obviously depression, which we'll talk about in a second, is a big part of that. But depression generally comes in two big categories, aside from mild, moderate, severe. There are people who get depressed, and they tend to be low energy, sad, oh, I'm, just, I'm just shutting down, I just have to sit here, I'm just not doing anything. And they're just crashing, shutting down. Those, those are people that 
we're concerned about needs some support, needs some help, needs some service, but they're not so likely to be suicidal. The other group of depressives are people who have an agitated, anxious depression. They're not uh, sleeping all the time. They're not tired. They're not low energy. They are hyper. They're, and they can't stay that their subjective distress is sky high. They're free from their panic. They've got to do something right now. That's what we're concerned about. It's an agitated depression. We used to think that um, anytime you're coming up with something new, and it's sort of true, anytime you, anytime you go to jail, uh, your first few days in jail, first three days in jail, that's how they're just, the first few days, first few weeks, a month, coming to college, coming to school, is a tough adjustment. Anytime you've made a big change like that, there's some adjustment. Actually, in depression, if you've been depressed a long time, you kind of adjusted, yeah, I'm kind of depressed, always have been. Or something happened, I just got depressed yesterday. It, that actually doesn't matter. Uh, depressed, depression in and of itself is sort of an issue. I mean, it doesn't make too much difference. Here's what happens also in depression. It's a, a emotional affective disturbance, there's no doubt about it. There's a cognitive constriction that occurs in part of people are depressed. They're, they're thinking and looking through life down a cardboard tube, right? Um, after a suicide has occurred, the thought is, well, why didn't they call me? I told them they'd always call me. They told me they could come where I could up. They could just come down and talk to me. No, they weren't, they weren't, they had blinders on. That, that's not what happens. Uh, you know, a suicidal crisis is a very transient, episodic event. Someone's not so much at risk. Someone becomes at risk and they get critically at risk. And then it tends to drop off and subside relatively quickly. Within a few days' time, it's sort of like this uh, hurricane that's going to roll in this weekend. It, we're right now, we're pretty okay. This weekend, we're probably not going to be okay. By Monday and Tuesday, yeah, we're going to be okay once we get everything calmed out. And that's kind of how a, a, a suicidal event occurs for most people. Um, so, in, in folks who are schizophrenic or have a, that kind of a more serious mental illness, uh, as many as 10% uh, of those folks kill themselves in their life that way. Mostly young men who are diagnosed as schizophrenic. So, college age, that's when schizophrenic. Uh, illness first presents itself, and so when somebody has their first psychotic break, either right after they stabilize or even during the midst of that, they kill themselves. Uh, that kind of is kind of critical time. Uh, cutters, and we'll just put up with this very long. Cutters are sort of different. That kind of has, I, we, we have to take care of folks who cut themselves and burn themselves and want to self mutilate a little bit and just, and as I do, I'm uh, self Injuries, behavior. A little bit further away from suicide than what you think it is. It's kind of connected, they're kind of cousins, but not as much as we're. It's a different process. So, anxiety and stress, all those things that happen when somebody goes away to school. Uh, the academic pressures, uh, relationships, all those kind of dynamics are certainly common features of uh, campus suicides. Um, what I would tell you is, in terms of like what to watch for, when someone's not depressed, but they're going to become depressed, they're getting depressed, that's most likely the first thing that happens. So concentration falls apart. They can't focus anymore, they can't concentrate. So somebody's been a good student, up to now they've just been super, uh, coming to college was a good idea. Um, they, they all, they've got a good track record, seems like a smart thing, and now they've read those same three pages 20 times and they can't tell you, you can tell themselves one thing, what those three pages say. Nothing's going in. They're not processing. Why? Because their brain is working on something else. Um, and so that's the first sort of uh, early warning sign, you can say, of a, of a depression that's sinking in is going to sort of become the issue. It's impaired concentration. Time time Antidepressants. Antidepressants do not cause people to be suicidal. We give antidepressants to very depressed people. 
because that helps them. It's kind of amazing, it's really impressive. But guess what? Even some of those depressed people still killed themselves. So this sort of media-driven issue that we think that, that people who have antidepressants are more likely to kill themselves because of the medicine, that actually is a silly notion. Uh, we used to use antidepressants called tricyclics. Elevil, uh, Trivil, and triptyline, things like that. But as a family of medicines, uh, were really toxic. A typical monthly supply that a doctor would write for somebody of Elevil is enough to kill you. Take that home, visit the doctor, to give these antidepressants, take it home, take it all, and you're talking to die of uh, cardiac failure, probably before they can even get you to a pharmacy. So many years back, actually a long time now, Prozac came out, and wow, it's incredibly effective, very potent, really useful that way. And the lethal dose of Prozac is pretty much a five gallon bucket. So go ahead, take all the Prozac you want. The little capsules probably gonna make you throw up before that Prozac uh, medicine is gonna hurt you. It's, it's that safe. Um, so, so we've really changed how we, the availability of how we treat depression. That's kind of why we're having the success we're having in taking care of folks who are depressed, because we now have the availability of very effective antidepressants that do a pretty good job. So we're looking at, we're, like I said before, how we evaluate all this. We're gonna look at those risk factors. Look at the clock now and then. Um, you have to ask the right questions. You should be, when you have a concern, if something that just is not sitting well with you, you should ask. Sit down and have a little conversation. People get skittish and they, they say funny things to people. It's kind of interesting. You're not thinking about doing anything, are you? Uh, yeah, I was going to do something. What do you do? Well, I, I'm going to go suffer a little bit. What, what are you talking about? You can say, listen, I know you're struggling. Gosh, tough times, I know. Do you have any thoughts about ending your life, killing yourself? Are you thinking about that? That doesn't give an, them an idea. Well, you know, you're right. Thanks for sharing that. You know, you're, my wife's got to get down the hopper. That is the answer, though. Thanks. I'm going to go and kill myself. That doesn't happen. Don't worry about that. People are going to say, yeah, how did you know that? Why did you ask me that? Because that's exactly what I'm thinking. So, so that's pretty cool. You have, yeah, yeah. Can I talk to you about that? So that changes the dynamics real quick when you ask the right question. So don't be afraid to ask somebody about that. And actually be, be specific. So here's what we're looking at. The, there's a, such a thing that we have, and, I, and I'm on a personal campaign to go over the country, although I don't go very far, to tell people to come do a safety contract. We have this silly thing we do. Somebody, maybe there's suicidal, and that we're worried about them. Listen, son, I'm, I'm worried about you, and I want you to tell you, I want to do this. I want, I want you to promise me you're not going to hurt yourself. And I want you to sign this piece of paper. And you get, uh, you get home, and you get to worried about things, you get to feeling bad, I want you to call me, you're going to call, go to emergency, I want you to do something. But if you sign this, that's your promise, that, that you're going to be okay. Okay, I'll sign it, you'll sign it, we'll have somebody else witness it, and that'll be our contract that you're going to be okay. So you can go home and not worry about it. Because you've got to sign a safety contract. Now, what else can you do for crying out loud? We're good, right? That's silly. That is, that's the first piece of evidence that the, they're going to enter at the courthouse when they sue you for wrongful death. Because you, it says right here on this piece of paper you were worried about them being suicidal. And your idea was having signed a piece of paper, that's your intervention, right? That's what you thought was good. And they're gonna bring a whole list of doctors in and tell you what a silly idea that is. And your insurance man is gonna say, how much should we write the check for? Let's just cut this too quick and just well, let me write the check for you. Because it's a silly idea, you shouldn't be doing safety contracts. Um, here's what we think about, here's how we make this assessment. We're thinking about, we're asking about, evaluating, do you have the thoughts? Do you have any ideation? That's where it begins, so we're gonna ask about that. Second of all, do you have a specific plan in mind? So exactly what would you do? You think if you, if you acted on that tonight, what would you be doing? Do you have the means for that? 
had a little kid tell me one time he was going to break into a hair, grab a 747, and crash it into Mount Rushmore. I'm good with that. Go ahead. Good luck to you, son. Uh, it's not going to happen. He doesn't have the means to do that. Now, I'm worried about him because he's having such you know, horrible times, but I'm not worried about him killing himself like flying a 747 to Mount Rushmore. A similar case, um, a little guy had a rope stashed in the barn, and when mom and dad go to bed at night, he was going to go to the barn and hang himself. Could he do that? Oh, yeah. Could he? Yeah. Did, had he planned for it? Was he prepped? Was it ready? Was the rope hidden? Yeah. He could do that. There, he had the means to do that. That's a different issue. Next, from there, we go on to the energy. Sort of like we're depressed folks, people tired like you are this afternoon. You don't have the energy to do anything. Right? So, so you have the energy to get and do it. Right? Even if you could fly 747, you don't really feel like doing that. That's going to take a lot. That's going to be really aggravating. It's not so much part of the assessment, but the last thing we do is we ask about perceived consequences. So if you did do something, like you didn't enter life, what do you think? What would happen? What do you think people would say? How's, how's, how's your dad going? What would he say about it? What would people think? What would your friends think? And what happens is you got to get a lot of information. Well, people will see how much I really, you know, then you're killing your wife. It will say something to people. But what is it you want to say? And that's, that's important to know. Ultimately, it's clinical judgment. You need to get the professional folks who do this, know how to do this, get somebody to their attention so they can do what their, their issues are. There are, there are not um, screening things, checklists, tests you can give. Well, let's just give them this little questionnaire. They'll, they'll say if they're suicidal or not, and they are. Get them help, but if not, okay, they're okay. No, there's no such thing as that. I looked at several of those uh, instruments, and they're actually a little bit on the silly side. So let's just play too much more than you need to know about how we kind of go around evaluating suicide. World's best person, this guy's so talented, it's, uh, it's, it's funny. And Dr. Sean Shea out of Duke University. Dr. Shea is the world's best. He has thought so much and has studied sort of how we evaluate suicidal folks and suicidal risk. Uh, here's what he has said, that if you have all the right information, everybody always makes the right decision on what to do. If I can tell you about somebody, and I tell you the whole scenario, you have all the facts. Everybody you would, I would tell you that case to, 100% of the time is like, well, that kid needs to be, to be at the hospital. He, we have to do something. He's suicidal. Yes, he is. I give you another scenario, still maybe distressing information, but let me give you all the facts for someone who's not really that much at risk. 100% of the time, people are going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't think he's that, I don't think that's it, he's that person. I don't think that, I wouldn't worry about that kid. But people always get it right. If you know everything, here's your problem, what happens? We don't know what's going on. And the way we ask questions makes us less likely to get all the information we need. So that's a problem. So if he has this notion that you're, you're going to ask about an incident, just like a videotape that shows how long you've been doing it. It's more like a DVD, the videotapes, you know. Anything. So uh, you want to have a sequence of what really is happening. Uh, it kind of goes like, you know, and again, if you didn't know, if you don't know what to ask, ask this. Well, what, what happened? So you did this, did it, and then what did you do? Then what, you know, what happened next? And then what did you do? But, you know, in real life, it goes like this. Uh, so, uh, the nurse tells me you're suicidal and you're upset, thinking about killing yourself. Tell me, what happened? Well, I had, we had a big, my girlfriend and I had a, had a big fight at the house, and uh, I was, I just lost it, and uh, couldn't take it. What's the question next? What happened after that? What happened next? Well, she got so mad, she, she's moving back to her mama in Kansas City. And uh, I don't know, I'll ever see her again. I was going to we gonna get married, and that's the end of that. I, I guess that's the end of her. Now I'm thinking, good, her and her mom are going to be miserable together. Okay? And so here's, here's my turning point. I can say, well, listen, have you ever 
been in counseling before. Uh, I could have all kinds of questions. I could, how, how's your health today? Are you feeling bad? You've got to stop. All kinds of other wrong questions I have, right? But I got real questions I'm supposed to ask you. You got headaches, stomach aches, blah, blah, blah. What's the right question next that I should ask? What happened next? Well, I went to the back bedroom and uh, I just started drinking. And uh, just thought I could just drink myself through this. I'm just so upset. What happened next? I remembered I had a pistol in the headboard. And I just took that pistol out and just sort of put it to my head for a while. What happened next? I, I finally decided she wasn't worth it, called 911, they brought me here, I'm talking to you. Okay. So you see from the beginning to where we are right now, I kind of see, I got what's happening. If I had stopped, when I said, well, what happened to them? Uh, yeah, my girlfriend and I, we had a, we had a big fight. Okay, I, I get it, you're upset, let me put this girlfriend. Uh, Am I ever going to get to the top part where he had a gun at home? No. Uh -huh. Am I going to ask him a lot of questions that make no sense or totally irrelevant? Yeah. How well will I understand his suicidal risk? Not very well. But all I ask is, what happened next? Then what happened? And then what did you do? So I have this, it's a really important process. So he also has four little techniques. Um, when you're talking with somebody that he lists out, um, you have to give people an out, right? We know that aggressive people do aggressive things, like kill themselves. Uh, so how do you ask if somebody's aggressive? So, so you see you go out a fair amount with your friends, you're in places, uh, do you start a lot of fights? You know, are you a big troublemaker? What are they gonna say? No, I, I, don't, I don't do that. But what if you said this? Do you ever go out sometimes with your friends and there's always somebody who wants to start up something. And then you have to be the one that's going to step up and kind of finish it. Sometimes you take them outside, you have to be the one to finish it. <clears throat> oh yeah, I'll do that. There's always somebody I have to sort of deal with. It's pretty impressive. So were they more likely to acknowledge